So I think we, we, we can get started. So uh, yeah, today, uh, welcome everyone. We are happy to have 3 Deep telling us about universality in asymptotic bounds and their saturation in 2D CFD. All right, take it away, 3 Deep. Thank you, Shuhan. So my, today the topic of my talk will be universality in asymptotic bounds and their saturation in 2D CFD. The talk is talk will be mostly based on uh, two papers, one of which I wrote with um, Bauer, who is here uh, back in April, and, and a recent one which I wrote with uh, Bitcargo from India and Iwa from Japan. So without further ado, as the title suggests, the, uh, our main motivation here is to capture the high energy data of CFT. So in general, most of the time, this data can be buried in various quantities like torus partition function, four point sphere correlator or two point torus correlator and so on. So roughly this kind of data can be written down in this following form where you have some parameter. So for example, this parameter can be, for example, in the torus partition function, this parameter can be uh, the Boltzmann function. So this is like a pointer minus beta E and, and it turns out this parameter uh, beta is tunable. And so you can tune them um, to extract the various, various data which sits here. And roughly the idea is that often you can express this whole thing in terms of, in terms of some dual expansion. So you have a different parameter prime and and there are crossing kernels which relates this parameter with the parameter prime. So once you know these crossing kernels, the idea, the key idea is that high energy data in one channel is dominated by the vacuum contribution in the dual channel. So once you know the vacuum contribution in this channel, you can say something about the asymptotic data in this channel. And to be more precise, we will be looking at large scaling dimension regime, possibly with order one scheme or democratically considering all the schemes. So roughly these two pictures depicts the things we are gonna look at. So on the right hand side, we on the H, H bar plane, we are looking at all operators which are in some particular regime uh, with fixed delta. And then as del we will be looking at all the operators or the OP or the asymptotics of the OP coefficients uh, such that this delta goes to infinity. So basically I have this full region and I am taking this region to infinity and counting all the operators which sits within this slice. You can make this analysis more sensitive. For example, you can project onto like fixed scheme on these lines and then count operators or look at OP coefficients on some particular interval and then take this interval to infinity and probe how many operators are there and so on. So roughly this is the regime of the CFT data which, which we want to focus. And, and I should emphasize that this, even though I, I, I am talking mostly about density of states, uh, uh, most of the time it works also for OP coefficients asymptotics of OP coefficient and asymptotics of other CFT data. And I will briefly mention how things differ slightly, but most of the time we have a universal picture of, about the asymptotics. So, so to, to give some concrete examples and to warm up, let us start with some simple examples. So first consider a zero plus one dimensional CFT and consider a four point scale, like the four point function of uh, scalar, identical scalar operators. So in the S channel, that is in the, in the, in terms of cross ratio where Z goes to zero in that channel, one can expand this uh, four point function in terms of scaling blocks. So you have this expansion and our goal is to find the asymptotics of this A delta, which has this uh, OP coefficients and which has this CFT data. And the idea is in the Z going to one limit, this four point function uh, is dominated by the T channel blocks. 
So in particular, the vacuum lock. So in the T-channel, you have identity uh, exchange. And from that, you can uh, say that in you know, a Z going to one limit, this sum is behaves like this thing on the right-hand side. And from that, you can easily conclude that this A delta has a polynomial growth like this. So, so this is the kind of scenario where Again, on one side, we have this uh, expansion, and then we are looking at some particular limit of this tunable parameter Z, and from that, we are extracting the asymptotics. Does the argument also use that one is the closest singularity to the origin in Z? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Here, it, it uses the fact that on the dual channel, if you Z goes to one, there is a singularity, and that singularity encodes the information about the growth. So moving on, uh, we can consider a Sorry, similar just thing. To clarify, this yeah. argument doesn't use the kind of complex plane, right? No, no, it doesn't use the complex plane. So at this point, this result only uses the fact you are z is real, and yeah. And I think so. The point. So if you use the, so there is there are error terms, and the estimation of error terms crucially depends on whether you are allowed to use the complex plane or whether you are on the real line. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, the reason I'm a little surprised you don't need the complex plane is that you <clears throat> suppose there was a pole in the complex plane closer to the origin than z equals one, then that would affect the large order behavior. Well, that would probably also affect the convergence of the series. And I guess yeah. there is assumption that it's convergent between uh, Z, zero and one. Yeah, yeah, on the unit. It converges on the real axis between zero and one, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah, I should also mention, ba so for the four point function, Bauer and Trasha wrote a paper. Um, so they actually utilize the fact that uh, like one can go to complex plane and estimate things and in a much better way. And their setup was for higher dimensional CFTs, but I think roughly the ideas goes through for this simple case as well. So moving on, uh, one can do the similar thing for modular invariant 2D CFT partition function. So this is the famous Cardi's argument. So on the left-hand side, you have the partition function, which you write down in terms of density of stairs, TE, and this Boltzmann factor. And then again, in the beta going to zero limit, there is a singularity, and you capture the singularity by doing the modular, modular transformation and going to the S dual channel. So you see this behavior in the beta going to zero, zero, this is a divergence. And by doing the inverse Laplace transformation on this quantity, you get the asymptotic degeneracy of stairs, which was derived by Cardi, and then this has also relation with the black hole entropy in ABS3. So this is another example where you use the uh, dual channel to extract the asymptotics. I will give you one more example, which involves modular covariant torus two-point function. So you can take this torus two-point function and for tau less than beta, you can expand it in terms of this CFT data on the plane and on the cylinder, and which is also related to the CFT data on the plane. So, so basically, the, again, the idea is in the beta going to zero limit, you can go to a dual channel and you can extract the leading behavior, which is this. And again, doing the inverse Laplace will tell you the growth of this quantity, which is nothing but asymptotics of two point correlator, like asymptotics of two light, two, two point correlator of two light operators O in some heavy state E. And again, this quantity is important because this is related to eigenstate thermalization hypothesis at large central charge. And also if you look at this quantity at the right hand side, if you analytically continue to the real time, you can see a exponential decay which is related, related to the decay of two point correlator in the Lorentzian time. So, so most of the time we will be playing this trick again and again, and, and, and we will extract the asymptotics of this, CF, this kind of CFT data. And, 
as the as we go along we'll see how we can make this analysis more precise and get some refined understanding and 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 since you can see there is a pattern recurring the pattern of calculation so this was nicely captured by the recent paper by scott and other people and where they show that there is a universal description of asymptotic of CFT data, which can be thought in a very generalized way. For example, in the torus two-point function, you can think of the, the, the sum over the direct channel as in, by this picture and the dual channel as this picture. And then basically the asymptotics in this channel is described by the, described by the vacuum in this channel. Which is basically the a trivial question. In the case of the torus, you use the fact that all the coefficients come with positive, all the coefficients are positive. Yeah. Right. In the case of the OPEs, it's less clear to me that, so yeah. there might be that some things are positive or negative, or maybe you use certain prop particular correlation functions where you can argue that all the coefficients are positive. Yeah, that's a crucial point. So not for all kind of uh, OP coefficients, we can do this trick. Uh, for some, for example, if you have four point function of identical things, then you can show that the expansion has f square. So it's sure. coefficient square and that in that works. Even for this torus example, it works. But uh, for example, if you want to do this trick with the one point function, like torus one point function, then you will see the three point function appearing in the expansion. And then there is no guarantee that it is positive. And yeah, you cannot play this trick rigorously. I see, thank you. Yeah. In the example shown here, if the external operators are uh, pairwise identical, uh, or if the, oper if the external operators here are identical, then unitarity will give you positivity on the yeah. left hand side. Yeah, yeah, right. Thanks. So here our idea is to, so here we want, so, so at this point it is clear that there is some sort of universality in the asymptotics in all kinds, in various kinds of CFT data. So here our idea is to make this, put this on a very rigorous fruit footing. And so we will do some refined analysis and then we will ask ourselves whether there is some universality in those refined analysis as well. And as we go along, things will be more clear. So, so as I was saying, we are going to do this more, do this more refined way. So to, and in order to do this refined analysis, we need to be careful about the error terms, the terms we forgot. So schematically, as I was mentioning that the, the form of the crossing is crossing equation is this. And we want to find the asymptotics of this stuff, which is presumably positive. The vacuum in the dual channel gives you the leading answer, which you already know. And then there are the error terms. So it turns out these error terms actually gives a notion of coarse graining to this quantity appearing here. And, and, and also these error terms are, are important, which actually controls the averaging window. So, so to speak that uh, this stuff E, this quantity needs some averaging. So you, you, it, it will turn out that you need to average this over a window to make sense of these formulas. And the, the size of the window actually depends on the error. And also there are much more fine grained structures. For example, if you take a unitary compact CFT, then you know the spectrum is discrete. But on the other hand, like you know that if you do the inverse Laplace of the vacuum, you get a continuous spectra. So looking back, just lo looking back from the Cardis analysis, it was clear that we need some sort of averaging because vacuum in the dual gives you a continuous spectra, but we know there is a discrete, the actual spectra is discrete. So that means some sort of coarse graining is, has always been happening. So here we want to, make this on farmer fruiting. So, so we want to study, care, we want to carefully understand this tail of this, this thing. And we want to put this quartz grain approximation on farmer fruiting. And as we go along, as we do this process, new quantitative results comes out from this refined understanding. For example, we can put some bounds on asymptotic spectral gap and so on. 
and we will also find some like and if we do this thing for uh, density of states or op coefficients and so on you will also find some universal features in this refined understanding so to go ahead i will briefly talk about the naive carty formula so uh, so in the naive carty formula you always start like you always write down density of states as an inverse laplace of this quantity so this is a formal expression and then as you all know that the idea is that in the beta going to zero limit this quantity is dominated by the s trans the s dual channel and the integral is dominated by the t equals zero point and but but the problem with this intuition is that this the intuition falls flat because of recurrence because if i look at this quantity and t equals zero in the dual channel it dominates the thing but then if we wait for long enough time this will again come back to its value at t equals zero so there is recurrence in this quantity so so in no way this integral is well defined and it is expected because i know the original row of delta is a density of states so it has support on some particular point it is a sum of bunch of dirac delta function so i should not expect this integral to be well defined so so our main aim would be to somehow make sense of this equation and make this equation more well defined and and in, an immediate thought would be to replace this e power it delta with some compactly supported function of t so that this integral gets cut off and then the recurrence would not spoil anything so 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 you can see this for example we, we can see this in the 2d ising model so you can plot this thing so this quantity z of beta plus it if you take mod square we call it spectral form factor this is an important quantity and if you look at the spectral form factor you will see that around t equals 0 this is dominated by the s dual channel and it drops out so you can for near the t equal zero region you can safely do the integral but but if you wait for long enough time it will again come back so there will be some partial recurrence here partial recurrence here if you wait long enough then there will be a full recurrence and and so if you do the integral over the whole region then this points will spoil the integral and you cannot control it so so to reiterate we need to cut off this kind of integrals and then the question is how do we how do we, how do we do it so we do it by some compactly supported function of t so we introduce some function phi hat of t here and then this by design this phi of phi hat of t has a compact support so this integral gets cut off at from lambda minus lambda to plus lambda but of course when we instead of this if we substitute something here then of course the left hand side gets modified so this is not rho delta anymore so this is some modified density of states and and we will see that this modification effectively introduces some sort of average so so now the idea is that we want to know that this modified rho of delta or average rho average rho of delta has something to do with with the actual row of delta so so that means we cannot put any compactly supported function of phi here so i need to carefully put some 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 sort of compactly supported phi hat function so that row delta gets modified but it's modified in a way so that still it has some relation with the original thing so this has been achieved in the paper by bauer and shasha back in 2019 so where they nicely set up this thing that they have this uh, characteristics function so basically you want to count the number of states in sorry i have another trivial question yes. is the question here a question about laplace transforms or is this a question about some physics where you need to put some more physics input to address the problem oh i think the question is about the inverse laplace so we are not in giving any extra input we are carefully treating the tails and carefully treating the inverse laplace and by that we are gaining some extra information which were not known before and and also putting the whole analysis on former graph 
So is this something that Laplace could have addressed or is there a new element here? Uh, so in the mass literature, this kind of analysis has already been done by these people like Karamata, Hardy, Lipilud and other people. So basically what Bauer and Shasha did, they adapted the formalism very nicely in terms of like in, in this setup. I see. And then, then we went ahead and do some, did some further analysis and got some nice results and new information. Yeah, but in mass literature, it was available. Well, may, maybe an extra comment. So uh, the when you just try to do the inverse Laplace transform, then uh, the problem is that uh, approximating the partition function just by the vacuum is not good enough. Uh, and the problem is uh, at this large t in the integral, where if you knew all the higher order contributions from other operators, you would be able to take the inverse Laplace transform. But if you want to just use the vacuum, then, uh, you, then you need to do this cutoff procedure. Maybe that helps. Yeah. Thanks. So moving on. So 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 because you you want to you do not want to put any kind of function here. So 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 you you think of a Fourier transform of this hatted function. So you define this as phi plus minus delta. And you choose this phi plus and phi minus in a way so that they majorize the characteristics function, this function. And so phi plus is uh, gives an upper bound on this thing and phi minus gives a lower bound on this thing. And then you can go into the Fourier domain and then you can write down this nice form in this nice form. And here the idea is that these integrals are cut off at minus lambda and plus lambda. So these integrals are well-defined and you can estimate this. And they nicely gives a lower bound and upper bound on the actual number of states which lives in this region. Uh, now the trick is to like evaluate this integral to nicely. And to do that, uh, I, like we go to the dual channel, we do a modular transformation and then separate it out into two pieces. One is the light piece and one is the heavy piece. And, the light piece gives the Cardi growth, which is the like, which is the actual Cardi analysis that you do an inverse Laplace on the on the on the light piece on the vacuum. This gives you Cardi growth, and then you want to show that the heavy piece is suppressed, and 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 to show that actually the heavy piece is suppressed, you you immediate that immediately tells you that this cut of lambda has to be less than twice pi, and. So, so you want to deal with a function phi, so whose Fourier transform phi hat has a support less than twice pi. So, so Bauer and Shasha wrote down some functions, and then 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 Bauer and I wrote down. Uh, we we did some more careful treatment, and we could show that that this equal this inequality can be saturated. So, in the sense, you can choose a function, and you can still allow lambda equals two pi. And this will later become important when you ask about optimal bounds. Okay, so, so the idea is the general formalism would give you after doing all the analysis, all these things, when the dust settles, you will land up with an inequality of this form where you have the actual number of states in this window of little two delta centered at capital delta and you are looking at this inequality in the del capital delta going to infinity limit. This rho zero delta are the actual Cardi answer, which you get by doing the inverse Laplace of the vacuum contribution. And these extra bits are the order one corrections that coming from averaging over a small window that coming from estimating the tail. So these order one numbers actually are function of this width, which is little delta. And at this point, you can see you can gain new information just by looking at this equation. For example, like if you look at the lower bound, 
I already said that this is a function of little delta. So, so if you can choose a little delta so that this function is positive, this value is positive, that means there has to be some state within that with, with that width. And which means you are putting an upper bound on the gap of the spectra. And so ideally, so I was talking about all the operators, but you can do the analysis for Virasoro primary only and write down a density of states like the inequality of this sort, which is only sensitive to the Virasoro primaries. And so that means if I choose a delta so that phi minus hat is positive, that will immediately give you a bound, a universal bound on the asymptotic gap between Virasoro primaries. So Bauer and Shasha put a bound and then their conjecture was that it has to be one. And then immediately after we proved this bound one by choosing some appropriate phi minus, the appropriate function. But then we are still lacking a general understanding, like how should we choose this? Because in this paper, our choice was a bit ad hoc. We played and we played, we did some trial and error and we gained some understanding, but the general understanding was still missing. So at this point, we had two questions. So is it like given this inequality, is it possible to find the best value of this order one numbers, phi minus hat zero and phi plus hat zero given a width? And are there CFTs which actually saturates these inequalities in, in a proper sense in a delta going to infinity limit? And once we have these uh, optimal values, optimal phi minus hat zero and phi plus hat zero as a function of little delta, can we recover the optimal value of the weight so that the lower bound becomes zero from this general understanding? So we want to, we want to find, that, find out a more general framework which would give this optimality very easily. So that was one sort of motivation of taking this up. And again, another line of thought was that, can we write down such inequalities for more complicated quantities like OP coefficients or two point correlator in heavy states? Because the idea is once we establish this sort of inequality, where now you should think rho delta as a proxy for different kind of CFT data, like not only density of states or rather some positive OP coefficient square or those kind of quantities, and the idea is once we establish this kind of inequalities, then the optimality analysis should follow. And we, could, we should be able to write down the optimal answer for this quantity and this quantity. And we should be able to find out CFTs which actually saturates this inequality. Um, and morally speaking that for OP coefficients, like we, we always expect similar kind of bounds and saturations. So, so the exercise for doing this analysis, extending this analysis for OP coefficients is morally speaking was not that challenging, but the actual challenge was in the text, some technical hurdles because, because unlike, so when you do the analysis for Virasoro primaries, you use the uh, known form of the characters for C greater than one CFTs, there is a universal form of characters, but on the other hand, the conformal blocks are not known explicitly. So, so you want you so so we bypass that problem by doing some numerics on the block and evaluating block on some particular thermodynamic limit, which was important. And so 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 there are a lot of numerics in so there are some sort of numerics involved in this work where we evaluated this conformal block in this limit. And then we could establish a similar kind of inequality. Okay, so 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 for rest of the talk, I will mostly focus on density of states regarding the discussion of optimality. And nonetheless, since I already mentioned that one can write down such inequalities for OP coefficients, so like most all of this will go through for for the analysis that. All of the things I will be telling you regarding optimality will also go through for these other CFT asymptotics. So is there any question at this point? Because now I will jump into more mathematical part. Okay. 
So moving ahead, I just want you to recall some basic features of these inequalities. So, so as I was telling that here you have the number of states in some particular window and you bound it with some quantities here, and rho zero delta has cardi-like growth and you have this order one number. Now to get the optimal bound, you want to optimize this phi plus hat evaluated at zero. You want to make it as minimum as it is possible. And you also want to make the phi hat minus evaluated at zero as maximum as it is possible. You also know that this hatted function has a finite support. So the support lambda is less than equals twice pi. So you want to maintain that. And you also know that these functions majorize and minorize the characteristic function. So basically like if you do go to the Fourier domain in the phi, where phi is a function of delta, it, uh, it phi plus uh, gives an upper bound on this characteristic function and phi minus gives a lower bound. So, so this is what we understand from the CFT picture. And then we realize that this problem of finding the minimum and the maximum is precisely related to another famous problem in math, which is called boiling Selberg problem. So to state the boiling Selberg problem, we consider again, consider this characteristic function and then give an upper bound and lower bound with phi plus and phi minus. So these bounding functions are continuous and they are integrable. And of course their Fourier transform has finite support because at the end of the day, we want to deal with such functions. And then the question is, what is the maximum of phi hat minus evaluated at zero? And what is the minimum of phi hat plus evaluated at zero? So pictorially, what we want to do, we want to, uh, so we want, so, so again, so here the characteristic function. So if you do a Fourier transform of characteristics function, then it does not have a compact support. So you are putting an upper bound and lower bound with some function which has compact support. And then these things requiring the maximum and minimum boils down to minimizing the area between these curves, like this upper bounding curve and the characteristic function and this lower bounding curve and the characteristic function. So pictorially you want to approximate the characteristic functions with this function and minimize the areas in between them. And one more important point, which, which, which is in, which is one more important point is the following, that because of continuity, the upper bounding function always takes an, like always takes an value one here or greater than one here. Whereas the lower bounding function always takes an value zero here or less than zero here. So, so technically speaking that, uh, here, even though we are writing a theta function here, in one case, the theta function does not include the age. And for the lower bound, for the lower bound, this is the case. And for other case, the theta function actually includes the age. So, and this will become important. So, so the next question is how do we obtain this extremizer? So as always to, to to analyze this kind of things, we, 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 we always do a two-step process. So we first obtain an upper bound on the minimum and lower bound on the maximum. And then we route, write down an explicit function which actually achieves this bound. And once you have these two steps, you have the extremizer on your, in your, at your hand. So, Moving on, we will focus on the case where the width is integer because it's easier to handle and explain. And later I will show you the result for when the width is not integer. So moving ahead to prove the, uh, so to, to so do the first step. So we want to do the upper bound on minimum and lower bound on maximum. So we start with something very basic. So we start with the points of summation formula. So the Poisson summation formula relates the, the hatted function with the unhatted one. And, and now we know that the, in the Fourier domain, the hatted function has a finite support. 
So this whole sum collapses down to a single term, twice pi phi hat plus minus evaluated at zero. And this is precisely the quantity you want to maximize or minimize. And on the right hand side, I have this full sum. But now I know this phi plus and phi minus are basically majorizer and the minorizer of this indicator function, of this characteristic function. So I can immediately replace this phi plus minus with the theta functions here. And then to achieve the best, I, there is a free parameter R here. I need to maximize and or minimize between these values R, where R goes from zero to one. So if you now, now think pictorially about this function, when the delta is integer, like when the two delta is integer, the width is integer, this basically tells you uh, this, this maximization is precisely the question that how many integer points can you fit in within this window? And it be, like after a moment thought it would become clear that you can always, the maximum number of integer, integers can only be fit, fit into this window when R is zero. So you want to set R equals zero here and once you set r equals zero, you will see that the maximum number of integers that you can fit within this, within this window is precisely twice delta plus one if you include the edge or twice delta minus one if you do not include the edge. So that means you immediately get this inequality where you know that the, there is a lower bound on the maximum and the upper bound on the minimum, which is twice delta plus one and twice delta minus one. So at this point, all you need to do is to write down or figure out a function phi plus minus, which actually gives you these numbers, twice delta plus one and twice delta minus one. But, there, but now, now the question is, how do we construct such functions? And there now, now you can, you can, you, you can look at this way this inequality is derived and see how one can possibly achieve a saturation. So to that, we start with this, we recall that when you said R equals zero, the, this equality is of this form. So, so that means it becomes clear for the extremizer, only the, this for, only the functions evaluated only at integers would matter. So, if somehow I can construct a function phi plus minus, which takes value one everywhere inside, everywhere at, in, takes value one at integers, if the integers are inside the window, like at these points. And if it is outside the window, like here, here, or here, or here, then it has to take zero. So, so the whole point is if we can construct a function which has this precise pattern, then they will satisfy this inequality and we will have our function. So this is kind of reminiscent of extremal functions which has been written down for a different context by Dalimil and other people. But, and you can see here, there are double zeros here and, and, and so on. So at this point, our job is to write down a function with these nice properties. And it turns out Boerling and Selberg had solved this problem long back and, and the functions is precisely of this form. So to give you some intuition, if you forget about this piece in the bracket, then this function sine square pi x in the Fourier domain, it exactly has twice pi support, but this would not work because the, it has zeros at every integers. So you want to kill some of the some of the zeros. Specifically, you want to kill the zeros which sits in between this interval. So you introduce this factor here. So this factor kills off all the zeros inside the window, and also make sure that the the second derivative is positive. So it is like this. But you know at the end point, it is not like this. So you parameterize that feature by introducing two more pieces like this, which is, and there is a free parameter lambda plus. And then the idea is you, you, you can write down an inequality on this lambda plus so that phi, plime, 
phi plus is actually is an upper bound on this characteristic function. In the same way, you can write down a phi minus. The construction is similar. You leave out the edge. So here the sum runs like you can see there is a equality here and there is an inequality here. So the sum run on sums run only over integers inside the window. And again, you can choose a lambda minus so that this actually works and phi minus is below the window. And, and it so turns out for a given value of delta, there is a range of lambda plus and lambda minus for which it works. So these functions are not unique for a given value of delta. And sorry, this should be two delta belonging to integer actually. And, but the only value of lambda plus and lambda minus, which works for all little delta is lambda plus minus equals one. So you can always choose one and make this thing work. And, and once you write down this function, you can evaluate the, the Fourier transform and you can evaluate the, the phi hat. You can evaluate these two quantities, phi hat plus minus zero. And you will find that this is precisely twice delta plus minus one. But this is expected because by construction you did it. So, so now the question, okay. So before, okay, before going ahead, I should mention one more point. So at this point, we solve the mass problem. We know that this phi hat plus this, if the phi has this regular pattern of zeros and this regular patterns of uh, separation of zeros, then it has to saturate the inequality and we have the optimal bound, but we are not done yet. We have to find some CFT example where the CFT spectrum coincides with this distribution of zeros. So basically, but basically we have to find a CFT where the spectrum is integer gapped. So we can always do that. So, so basically it turns out the CFTs with integer gap in the spectrum would be a natural candidate. And here by CFT, I only mean my ability to, our ability to write down a modular invariant partition function. So the idea is one can write down a zoo of saturating modular invariant partition function, which saturates this inequality, which is constructed out of this monster CFT partition function. So this is a polynomial, the k degree polynomial of j function and there's another function sitting here, j a to the power three. And it turns out all these CFTs has c equals four a plus 12 k. So this is like a multiple of four. And for all these central charge values of central charge, one can write down CFTs with spectra having integer gap and all these CFTs will saturate the inequalities I, we wrote down before. So, so, so this is our optimized Cardi result, which we wrote down. And you can, you can see that here, we, we are very cautious about writing it in a separately. So, so this is the theta function where we include the um, H things. And here, this is the theta function where we do not include the H thing. And, this, when we include the H thing, this is saturated by this twice, this is upper bounded by this twice delta plus one rho zero delta. And when you do not include the things, it is twice delta minus one times rho zero delta. And again, the inequalities are saturated by CFTs with spectral gap of one, any kind of CFT, if they have spectral gap of one would satisfy this. And we can also see that the lower bound becomes zero when twice delta is one. So this recovers the previously proven result that the optimal gap is one. Again, like, like this analysis, the way I have been stating, like this analysis. So if you look at the all operators, then this gap one is trivial because it will be saturated by the descendants, but then you can always redo the analysis for Virasoro primaries and then it is a non-trivial bound. And, and, and last but not the least, when with this not integer, you can still show that this is an bound, but when the with this not integer, the optimal value coming from the math analysis is different. 
and 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 this can be nicely and cap captured by this picture where you can see that we have two lines this is twice delta plus 1 this red dotted line and the other line is twice delta minus 1 and whenever delta is half integer this curve actually touches this line so these are the expressions i showed and these are the points where i have cft examples but when delta 2 delta is not an integer the bounds can be squeezed a little bit so i have this 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 allowed region here. So even though we have a solution from math problem, we like for all these solutions, the zeros are not regularly gapped, like not gapped in by one. So we did not find any CFT example which actually saturates this thing when two delta is not integer. But the math solution still exists. I have a question. Is the is the blue curve non-analytical in this case? Uh, non you mean at this point? The uh, no, is, is, I mean, is, is there is there no 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 analytic function which gives this which gives the blue curve in this plot? Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah, we wrote down the functions. Yeah, okay. that's true. So we did it case. So there is a. So this is done. I should have written the name. So this is done by Littman. So and this is a very recent, like 2013 paper or so, where, so he wrote down a generalized form of Poisson summation formula, and then from that generalized form of Poisson summation formula, you can put an upper bound on the minimum and the lower bound on the maximum, and then you can write down a function. Yeah. But then the zeros are not integer spaced. They they are. Yeah, they are slightly irregular. Do, 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 do you expect that, 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 that the partition function which corresponds to that, that solution actually exists or? I do not know of any example. And yeah, I don't know. So the only thing I can tell you that, so uh, even though they are irregular, asymptotically the gap between the zeros of those functions becomes actually one. But I don't know whether that helps. Um, yeah, yeah, we yeah to yeah, yeah. We do not have any example for this case. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, yeah. Then we can we went ahead and we did the <coughs> sorry. Then we did the same analysis with the fixed spin version. So in the fixed spin version, one of the crucial input was T invariance, uh, which implied that uh, we have integer spin, and then one can project the partition function, like do a Fourier projection on the fixed spin. And once we have this Fourier projection, one can play the almost the same game and wrote, write down the similar kind of functions. And the only change is now the optimal function, the optimal function would give you value twice delta minus two rather than twice delta minus one. And from this, you can see that fixed spin case, the optimal gap is two, which is basically saturated by, if you take a chiral monster CFT and the, like the, another monster CFT and combine tensor them together, they would trivially satisfy this gap. So this is the fixed spin version. And then I was, as I was mentioning, again, coming back to OP coefficients, one can play the same game with the OP coefficients with bit of numerics. And then, uh, then one can again prove similar kind of bounds and where the optimal function will give you like twice times delta minus two and twice times delta plus two. And this A0 delta are the ones which you get from naive Cardi analysis. And as Nati was saying that this thing is here, this thing is positive, so we can safely do this. There is no issue. And here the fixed spin is gap is four instead of two. And this happens because we are considering identical scalars. So there is some sort of symmetry. And also there is a one over H factor appearing here, which was not uh, recognized before. And this is a new feature and uh, which comes from looking at the conformal block in some particular, uh, in some simultaneous limit, which is this limit. 
So, and it turns out when we did some numerics, we found out that this value H uh, is one only when uh, H, the external operator divided by the central charge has this precise C over 32 value. So here I have plotted the H minus one, which appeared in that thing. And you will see that this deviation from one is least when I have this thing. And as I go away from this one over 32, it turns out this value saturates to a different value and that gives some order one correction. And at this point, we do not have very like analytic understanding why this happening. This is happening but at least from plotting this uh, recursion block on in the required limit reveals this feature. Okay, and then, then, then one more comment, that's the similar bounds can also be obtained for two point correlator of light operators in heavy states, which we explored. So here we are bounding this kind of things. And then you can see that it has a lower bound and upper bound. And where, so even though I have written it in terms of T over beta, the beta should be uh, understood as a function of the, these heavy states here. And this inequality is written in the limit where T over beta is finite, but both of them go to zero. And again, the boiling cell bar will give you this two delta plus one and two delta minus one. Okay, so, so finally, I just want to give you a brief overview of what we have learned by doing all this exercise and all these techniques. And, and so, to, so to wrap it, wrap, it, wrap it up, all these results fall into a statement of this following kind where, the, where we say the microcanonical ensemble with order one width is same as the canonical ensemble. So basically we are proving some fundamental feature here. And most of the time, like, like in the CFT literature, when we talk about asymptotics, people always talk about how this asymptotics captured the eigenstate thermalization thing. But there is a slight catch over there, which I want to emphasize and which has also been emphasized in uh, Scott's paper that the eigenstate thermalization statement talks about single eigenstate. So all these results in the CFT where we talk about asymptotics, the original result has only been proven for microcanonical ensemble with order one weight. Ideally, one would like to squeeze that weight to an exponentially small weight. And only then one can talk about chaotic CFTs or ETH-like statements. But that part has not been done yet. And, 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 and as the, as the calculation goes, the, we already knew the leading answer comes from the vacuum in the dual channel. And to re-emphasize re that tail actually controls the size of the averaging window. The size is always order one and we have found the optimal size and it is optimal considering all the CFTs. And so in some sense, the rational CFTs come close to the saturation. So while the inequalities are true for all CFTs, in some sense, rational CFTs and the CFTs with regular gap come close to saturation. And for chaotic CFTs, we expect this size would be exponentially small and presumably one can do a better estimate of the tail by inputting some extra thing. But, the, but I guess this is still an open problem because we still do not know what that extra thing would be. Um, and, and to think along the same line, if you if you if you have noticed, you will know like if you are if you are careful, you have might have noticed that the difference in the lower bound and the upper bound are exponentially large. So we had twice delta minus one times rho zero delta in the lower bound, and in the upper bound I, we had twice delta plus one rho zero delta. And so since both are saturated, it might be puzzling, but the but the resolution to the puzzle is that. Recall, we made a distinction about whether we had the H states or not. So this, this, this gap between this lower bound and upper bound precisely tells you that there can be huge accumulation of states at the edge. So, and so, 
So again, while this is true for rational CFTs, we do not expect such thing to happen in the chaotic CFT with non-degenerate spectra. So we do not expect such large gap between the lower bound and the upper bound. So our expectation for the chaotic CFTs are of this form, where instead of minus one and plus one, we have some exponentially small numbers. But again, this is an open problem. We want to like we want to achieve this, and the whole point is we have to give some extra input so that this output comes out. And another technical remark of doing this whole exercise in different examples that, so you can do this analysis as a function of Delta, or you can also think of doing this analysis in terms of H and H bar, the left moving conformal weight and the right moving conformal weight. And then there is a generalization of boiling cell bar optimization problem on the, on the plane. So you can write down the optimizers, you can write down the functions, and then, then there's a solution to the math problem. But it turns out, again, the optimal solution coming from the math problem does not coincide with the optimality in the sense of CFT. So, and then it becomes clear if you use T invariance, only then you can say the spins are integers and you can project onto a fixed spin, and again, you can, do the analysis Bauer and I did, and then the two notion of optimality concise. And this feature is uh, also common in the analysis of the OP coefficients. So it, it seems like when you want to make the analysis spin sensitive, it is important for the optimality that you use the T invariance and you use, you project onto fixed spin and, and only think about optimality after that. And then I want to make two comments about large central charge CFTs. I did not really talk about large central charge in this talk, but as Bauer and Shasha showed that the formalism also worked for large central charge CFTs. And we have a universal Cardi-like formula for delta greater than C over six, which has also been previously done by Hartmann, Keller and Stoika. But so I just want to make a comment here that the optimal bound we found this optimal in the large central charge limit, these optimal bounds can only be recovered in some double limit where you take the large central charge limit followed by large scaling dimension limit. So at this point, we do not have a generic picture of optimality as a function of Delta over C. So in the large central charge, we generally take Delta over C to be finite and take C goes to infinity. So ideally you would like to, in this large central charge limit, ideally you would like to have a picture of optimality as a function of delta over C, which is not there yet, but still we can show that the bound stays order one. So it's not like if you take like C going to infinity, you can get some output where the bound is exponentially small. So for exponentially small gaps, you need to have extra physics inputs. And also one, one, as also one other thing that we know the Hawking phase transition happens at beta equals twice pi. So the, the difference between this large, in, in large C and the not large C regime is the relation between beta and the delta, the thermodynamic relation. So it turns out that uh, this thermodynamic relation is very different uh, for the large C regime. And because of this relation, uh, you can immediately show that the thermal regime is beta less than two, twice pi, and this immediately boils down to this delta greater than C over six. So, so this is a, another heuristic way to see that why the Cardi formula is only universal in the large central charge limit after this threshold, not after C over 12. And to conclude, we have these open problems. So we want to have central charge dependent optimal bounds like the recent optimal bounds obtained in the context of modular bootstrap and sphere packing by Zalimil and other people. So, so it might be nice to like, so, so our bounds are not central charge sensitive. So it's uniformly applicable to CFTs with all central charge. So maybe one can do better if one like gives the information that we sent like which CFT or which central charge CFT we are looking at. And another hard problem, and of course, very interesting problem is to define a proper notion of chaotic CFT on the level of spectrum. 
so that one can see finer universal features like the random matrix theory. A natural choice is to impose twist gap, but it seems not enough to impose twist gap. And to, it seems there, there should be more inputs to actually do this in this way. Um, and as always, like we have explored a lot of, lot, of, lot of different examples like OP coefficients and so on, but there are many more examples. So the techniques can be generalized for four point function in hierarchy. Maybe one can show that the generalized free field theories actually saturate this kind of bounds. And one can think of higher genus partition function in 2D. And maybe to do this, one might need some kind of numerical assistance because the conformal blocks create a problem. So yeah, but but one can still still push this. So that's all I have to say. Thank you.